So um, let's start. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, on what is a, a, a bittersweet occasion for me, um, because uh, before this uh, crisis began and everything um, uh, was going to, uh, yeah, and everything kind of went a bit strange, um, we were going to uh, be launching Nick's book. And we had a, uh, we had a glittering guest, guest list assembled. Michael Gove was going to give a speech. You, know, um, you, were, you were all going to turn up. And you were all going to get you buy Nick's book and, and swell his bank account. And instead, he's been reduced to, uh, to sitting on a Greek island in the, in the beautiful sunshine, uh, dialing in to, um, to, to, a, to a virtual event. Um, so thank you very much, Nick, for interrupting your holiday. Um, thank you all for, for joining us. I'm, I'm Robert Colville. I'm the director of the Centre for Policy Studies, uh, founded by this lady behind us, uh, which is obviously uh, potentially germane to our discussion. Um, we will be ending the uh, discussion at uh, six o'clock sharp because uh, Nick needs to see whether Aston Villa survive in the Premier League or uh, plunge into oblivion <laughs> and, um, and um, to, to try and um, uh, so he and Nick, Nick will, will say a few words um, then he and I will talk then we'll open it up to questions um, just to um, to try and keep things moving smoothly um, if you put your questions in the q and I'll try and sort of relay them to Nick um, and so, so that way I can I can merge topics and also uh, it just prevents that um, that sort of really awkward thing of going to someone and they turn out to be of getting a cup of coffee uh, or, or what have you, um, but um, you know, you, we, I mean, we may we may revisit that as, as we go. But um, we will try and just just keep things moving. So um, Nick Timothy, uh, author of Re Remaking One Nation, uh, which is showing up in the wrong way around on my screen, but um, that is the right way around in, in front of it. Um, Conservatism in an age of age of crisis. Uh, uh, do you want to um, kick us off? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, it is true that uh, the book launched in uh, the least auspicious of circumstances because it was the beginning of the lockdown. What Rob doesn't know is that the US launch coincided with uh, the unprecedented race riots um, uh, across the states. So I've told the publishers that uh, I don't want any kind of launch for a paperback edition as I'm worried it will uh, herald some kind of alien invasion or something awful like that. Um, uh, I thought I thought we could, we can obviously talk about absolutely anything in the Q and A uh, later, but um, I thought I would shamelessly make some of the arguments uh, that are in the book in the opening talk. Uh, partly because I think, um, and I would say this, wouldn't I, that um, a lot of what I say in the book has actually become uh, more relevant since the onset of the pandemic. Uh, the related economic crisis, the subsequent behavior of China, uh, and the cultural divides that are coming to the fore through Black Lives Matter and related debates and protests. Um, what I try to do in Remaking One Nation is trace our problems today back to the ideas behind the policies that got us here. Uh, and in particular, I'm trying to explore some of the flaws in philosophical liberalism and the way liberalism has mutated into more extreme forms uh, across the left, right and centre of politics. And I argue that conservatives need to liberate themselves from liberalism, uh, rediscover their own philosophy and apply that philosophy to the problems we have today, uh, to borrow the language of Disraeli and Baldwin, to make us one nation once again. Um, in essence, I say we, we have to start looking at liberalism, uh, which is, after all, the ideology that has constructed uh, our modern world with a more sceptical eye, uh, because many of the aspects of life that we've been told are unavoidable and universal aren't really any such thing at all. Uh, really, many of them are the product of ideology. And this ideology is, of course, not as extreme as some of those that it's very easy to reject, like socialism, or fascism or communism, um, but it is still an ideology. Um, and, and as some of the uh, contradictions and failures of that ideology start to show, uh, liberalism and, and more extreme liberalism uh, is actually becoming more illiberal and intolerant towards uh, dissenters. Um, so what I'm trying to do is explain how things have got this far uh, and what conservatives can do about it. And I say we need to counter this ultra-liberalism and develop this new conservative agenda that respects personal freedom but also demands solidarity, that reforms capitalism and rebuilds community and rejects selfishness while embracing our obligations towards others. 
Uh, but it's also a warning that conservatives need to be careful to defend the essential liberalism that stands for pluralism and our democratic way of life. Um, essential, essential liberalism, I say, is what uh, makes liberal democracy function. It requires not only elections to determine who governs us, but checks and balances to protect minorities. Uh, it demands good behavioural norms, uh, including a willingness to accept the outcome of election results and referendum results. Um, and it requires support, qualified support, for, uh, for free markets. Uh, essential liberalism is powerful because it doesn't pretend to provide a general theory of rights or justice or an ideological framework that leads towards the harmonization of values and interests or a single philosophical truth. It understands that values and interests are uh, by their nature always in conflict and it therefore respects political diversity. Um, when it comes to ultra-liberalism, of course there isn't a single ultra-liberal agenda. Uh, I say that there's, a, there's an elite liberalism shared by most members of the governing classes, but not necessarily the wider public. Uh, this is how you end up with policies like mass immigration, multiculturalism, uh, but also a lightly regulated labour market, a limited support for the family, and support for supranational government of different kinds, despite uh, regular elections. Uh, but we also have... Uh, an ultra-liberal ratchet, uh, which are beliefs that aren't shared across the party divide, but which keep propelling liberalism forward. So on the right, you have market reformers who mainly think of the economy. Uh, and on the left, you have cultural liberals uh, who pursue their agenda of uh, militant identity politics. Um, and what happens is one side might attempt to reverse some changes made by the other, but actually often most end up remaining. Uh, and so market reformers and left liberals end up reinforcing one another. Um, they've both left us uh, with the combination of their policies with a degree of economic dislocation, social atomization, and a state that uh, perversely for the, for the right ends up getting bigger because it's left trying to pick up uh, the pieces. And the trouble with all these forms of ultraliberalism is that they're based on a conception of humanity that isn't real. Uh, because right from its earliest days, liberalism was built on uh, this false premise that there aren't just universal values, but also natural and universal rights. Um, and the flaws of the state of nature theories uh, mean that liberalism from the start had different features uh, hardwired into it. So citizens are autonomous and rational individuals. Their consent to liberal government is just assumed and rights are natural and universal. And this explains why many liberals believe that the historical and cultural context of government is irrelevant. Uh, institutions and traditions that impose obligations on us could just be cast off. All that matters as far as government is concerned is the freedom of the individual and the preservation of their property we can be given legal rights without corresponding responsibilities. Duties to others are seen as just unfair hindrances. Um, and uh, liberals often ignore our relational nature, our dependence on others and our reliance on institutions and the norms of community life. In fact, they quite often take community and nation for granted and they don't have very much to say about uh, the obligations as well as the rights of citizenship. Um, and as liberalism developed, further flawed ideas came with it. So um, John Stuart Mill, for example, uh, devised the harm principle in which individual liberty could only be restricted um, if somebody's actions risk damaging the interests of others. But the harm principle fails to acknowledge that all of our actions and inactions to some degree affect those around us. And precisely because values and interests conflict with one another, we can never really agree about what clearly constitutes harm. And Mill and some other liberal thinkers sometimes argued that pluralism and tolerance were only worthwhile because the trial and error that they make possible, together with our rationality, uh, leads to truth and an increasingly perfect society. Uh, in the book, I call this liberalism's teleological fallacy, this assumption that your own beliefs stand for progress. Uh, that quite often makes liberalism illiberal. It becomes intolerant of supposedly backward opinions 
norms and institutions. Um, uh, and that intolerance, uh, um, concerning so intolerance towards people who uh, remain loyal to older ways of life. And this illiberalism you can see quite clearly right now on the ultra-liberal left. Uh, and in the book I argue that left liberals are, are influenced by postmodernists like Michel Foucault and the, the American thinkers who are mainly behind the rise of uh, identity politics. And for these people, discourse is oppressive. So people aren't in charge of their own destinies. Their reality, their social reality is imposed on them through language and customs and institutions. And even the victims of the powerful participate in their own oppression through their own language, uh, stories and assumed social roles. So as a result, left liberals don't really just want to remove the hierarchy, but they want to penalise those who they believe subjugate others. Uh, so equal political rights aren't enough for them. Uh, because historically power lay with white men, today, whiteness and masculinity are characteristics that must be attacked. Because we don't understand how our own social roles are constructed, we don't understand the meaning even of our own words. So those who hear us, particularly if they're members of marginalised groups, understand better than we do the true meaning of what we say. Uh, and because discourse is itself a form of violence, free speech is no longer sacrosanct and it's legitimate to meet violent language with violent direct action. Uh, and I don't just talk about uh, the, the left and uh, the centre in the book, I also do talk about the right and liberalism's uh, effects uh, there, where, where support for the free market can sometimes turn into a non-interventionism and an ideological attachment that can blind some of its adherence to reality. Uh, so struggling communities that have lost their social capital, that are lacking infrastructure and have few opportunities for young people often end up neglected thanks to scepticism about government action and uh, an ideological belief that the invisible hand is likely to come to the rescue. And instead, uh, policy energy is quite often devoted to deregulating the labour market and marketising public goods. Uh, Hayek's argument, for example, that no political system, not even a democratic one or even a small and local one, can accurately reflect collective choice like the market, uh, obviously holds great sway on the right. And so for Hayek's supporters, it follows that the NHS can't be the right way of delivering healthcare because consumer choices and real pricing don't drive decision making. And the same goes for other public services from public transport to schooling. Um, so I argue in the book that we need a break with ultra liberalism in all of its forms. Uh, there are certainly some signs that, uh, that under Boris, uh, the Conservatives are shifting away just a little bit from uh, both economic and cultural liberalism. Uh, but time will tell if that's what happens, if the Tories are willing to become more conservative and less liberal on both the economy and questions of culture and identity, and if they're prepared to go uh, the whole way. Uh, I mean, I hope that they do. Uh, and in the book, um, um, the reason I give is that there is more to life than the market, there is more to conservatism than the individual, and there's more to the future than the destruction of cultures and nations. And too often that is what ideological liberalism leads us towards. Well, um, I could argue with about you about that for quite quite a while. Yeah, um, <laughs> and we should. In fact, it's, it's practically in my job description uh, to, to do so. Um, uh, you, you know, um, I mean, I, I think you, you know, the <laughs> the fact that you the way that you basically equate um, you know um, uh, you know the, the the way you basically equate Corbynites and um, and libertarians. I mean, I, mean, <laughs> I think it's definitely definitely puts noses out of joint, but. Um, the topic of, 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 that we've sort of set is, is 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 the kind of future of the Conservative Party, and so you know, and and it feels like you know, whether whether just due to the Brexit vote or just due to that, you know, that things are are moving in the direction that you you, you prescribe. So um, you know, the government like a couple of weeks ago spent five hundred million pounds to buy a satellite firm. That's you know, that's a that's not you know that's that's picking like picking winners they, you know, that's you know that's the, the kind of stuff, you know um on the culture you, and i'm sure you've seen you know the, on, on the culture stuff obviously you know there is this the government is, is setting itself up and i think rightly so against the excesses of um uh, of the um of, of that um 
or, or you know of the sort of woke woke, woke, woke agenda. Um, but I mean, I I mean, leaving aside our different economic analyses, um, where I would obviously be much 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 more in favour of the market than, than than you are. I mean, I think one of the problems I have with your with your analysis and sort of to an extent Boris's analysis then. Uh, and it's one of the things we picked out is, you know, like Michael Gove gave an entire speech on why the state doesn't work. But you then you're relying on, the, you know, you, your brand of that brand of your brand of conservatism kind of relies on the state, on the effectiveness and goodness of the state. You know, like you, you literally talk about, you know, you, you, you talk about and you had Theresa May talk about the good that government can do. Um, which, uh, which I, I, I pointed out was probably not the message you wanted on the landing page of the sign up to be a Conservative Party member. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I suspect everyone um, uh, is a little bit guilty of this uh, because actually political debate tends to sort of lead to people adopting black and white arguments in, uh, um, uh, in that debate. Uh, but I mean, correspondingly, I think a lot of people on the sort of free market right uh, sort of um, lord the market um, while sort of conveniently forgetting quite a lot of uh, the, the failures of the market and the limitations of the market and so on. Um, uh, it is a fair complaint to say that, uh, that I think the state should take a more strategic role in the economy while also arguing that um, the state has its limitations. Uh, the state needs to be, uh, I strongly believe the state needs to be reformed. Um, you know, at the centre um, in London, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of ways in detailed ways in which we can talk about how it can be reformed. Um, but I won't do that right now. But in the centre, I think it needs to be um, uh, smaller, uh, higher quality. Um, uh, departments probably need to be, need to be actually a little bit more like the Treasury in terms of their leanness um, and the talent of the people that they uh, try to recruit and the expertise that they develop. Um, uh, and one of the ways in which it can become leaner is by decentralising the state. Uh, and I, I think I think actually devolution is pretty terrible uh, um, for the future of the union um, and, uh, and because it misaligns uh, accountability and responsibility in terms of what is devolved to uh, the governments of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and it obviously always fails to address the English question. I mean I personally favour a move to a, uh, a cleaner move to a more federal system in the UK but then within that federal system, I would still want to see quite a lot of uh, devolution to cities and counties. I mean, when, we, when we were talking about this, I mean, you, you know, I've got a picture of Thatcher behind me. You, you would have, if, if you weren't on holiday, you would probably have a picture of Joseph Chamberlain behind you, who, apart from his woefully misguided views on free trade, um, was, you know, was part of this tradition of municipal, uh, you know, municipal politics and municipal activism that we have completely lost in, in our country. Yeah, I think we have. And um, I mean, I think I mean, one of the things I think the, the, the Cameron Osborne government uh, um, at least deserves um, some limited credit for is, uh, is the creation of the, of the Metro mayors. Uh, because I think what, what that uh, allows is for, you know, something like Joseph Chamberlain in the 21st century wouldn't stand to be a councillor in his local ward and spend 15 years on the sort of, uh, you know, the sort of rubbish delivery committee or the, um, uh, or, sorry, collection committee or, uh, or anything like that. Um, I mean, he became mayor and was completely transformative within, I think, less than three years. Um, uh, and I think the, the directly elected mayors mean that we will probably have higher calibre leaders because it, it allows people with a particular pedigree and experience to be elected straight to the top. Um, uh, but that's just one thing and, and actually there's the scope for uh, greater powers being given to political units below uh, mayors. I mean, however you want to organise local government, it becomes a bit of a can of worms, but um, things should be a, a sort of more local under them as well. Um, uh, but we, we desperately need, I think, a wave of uh, enabling legislation that will decentralise uh, power to localities um, and give not just elected leaders in those places, but actually communities themselves powers to stand on their own two feet and take responsibility for the problems 
uh, in their neighbourhoods, and also I think a wave of institution building. And a big part of uh, that institution building should be about creating local institutions that are capable of doing things like uh, working with employers and counsellors and education uh, um, providers to to work out the skills needs of a particular uh, local labour market, but also things like um, uh, I think we, you know, I think we underestimate conservatives who want to give power to society and community tend to underestimate the extent to which, in lots of places, uh, social capital and civic confidence has been really depleted. And so we're going to need to create institutions, I think, that will help to catalyse the kind of social action we'd like and to build. Uh, social capital um, in those struggling communities. And there's, an, there's an interesting parallel here with the Conservative Party itself, which has always struck me as an institution which is, is profoundly unwilling to practice what it preaches in terms of, in terms of you know, the, whether it's talking about the virtues of competition or, or the virtues of localism. It, you know, there isn't the, you know, the con, you know, you, you might, I mean, I, I'd be interested in your take on this because you, you, you've been involved with it for longer than I have, but, you know, the, the, would you like to see the Conservative Party itself more embedded in, in local communities and more of a sort of activist force in those communities as opposed to uh, something where, where it all sort of feeds, feeds back to London? Yeah, well, I think there's probably a couple of ways of thinking about that. Um, I mean, firstly, if we're devolving meaningful power to... Uh, to counties and to cities and to the big metropolitan areas, uh, then we're going to need to be prepared to accept a greater independence uh, of conservative politicians from those places. And certainly if we move to a more federal system, we would, uh, we would have to do that. There's a separate thing that I've thought for some time now, which is, I, I mean, I am stupid enough to be a member of the party, um, uh, but actually, for most people, there isn't really a clear reason to do it. Uh, you, you, you know, you pay your uh, annual membership fee, and you know, once every well, it's been a bit more frequent recently. But you know, in, in, in the good years, once every sort of ten years or so, you might get a vote in a leadership election. And in the intervening period, you get harassing emails telling you to give more money than you've already given. Um, uh, so they don't really. My, my, my favourite example of this is that the um, the button for, for leave us a gift in your will was always, <laughs> bigger, in the, it was always bigger than the than the button saying join the party in the PR emails. Yeah, it's almost like that's all they're interested in. Um, uh, uh, whereas actually, I think especially if we do want conservatives to be um, a, a social force for good in particular communities, then actually um, rather than thinking about conventional membership, we should probably be thinking about the party as uh, something like a platform where we're facilitating people um, to organise themselves locally on things that might not be to do with helping to get their local Conservative candidate elected in the general election necessarily, uh, but might be about um, how to campaign against that completely inappropriate, um, you know, planning permission for, the, for an incinerator or something, uh, which will draw more people into politics. It will show the Conservative Party to be a more socially... Uh, uh, sort of minded institution than people perceive it to be, and it might actually provide a future source of uh, of activists for the party. So, I mean, I'm sure you've seen the, the, the interesting polling recently. Um, I think it was UK uh, in a changing Europe, uh, sort of branching out from there from from Europe to talk about the UK. Um, the polling on on, on the, where the political parties sit, and essentially what it found was that Labour MPs and activists and the general public are pretty much in this and, and labor voters are in pretty much in the same place uh on on economics and labor mps and activists are hopelessly divorced from the public on cultural issues with the tories the, the, the tories are bang on with their voters on cultural issues but the, the the tory voter base especially after 2019 is now sort of much to the left of people like me who you know talk about hayek and small states and uh, you know fiscal responsibility um so i mean sort of two questions there does this mean you know, in in the long term do you think the logic is that the the, the party comes to resemble its voters or um or the, or the voters move more towards the party or uh, and also and also um you know how does this um how, you know, how does this play out in terms of in terms of political debate? You know, are we are we going to see a 
a sort of five year wrangle in which Keir Starmer keeps trying to talk about the economy and Boris Johnson keeps trying to talk about culture because those are those are the strong uh, the strong suits. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a few different ways of responding to research like that. Um, I mean, firstly, I think the research is uh, reflects reality because there's quite a lot of research in different um, Western countries that shows uh, oh, there's a there's a book um, I think called the Two Majorities, which I think first made this argument in America, uh, which I think you cite in your in your book. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, which um, which I think sort of actually influenced electoral strategists there, where uh, it was instead of instead of, instead of trying to change uh, voters' minds, or instead of really trying to change. Uh, necessarily uh, the fundamentals of your position you would you would try to change the subject as much as trying to change people's minds um, and and you did this research uh, generally does show that uh, that by and large when it comes to the economy and spending people are slightly to and intervention in the economy people are slightly to the left and then on matters of culture and identity uh, they are slightly to the right one of the interesting things about that for me uh, is that uh, you know, the sort of electability test, the moderation test that the media um, and, you know, opinion formers in Britain have tended to apply has been about centrism uh, and, and centrism in a sort of political and economic sense has tended to be the very reverse of that. It's tended to be a bit towards the right on economy and spending. Uh, and left on culture and identity because it's been much more open-minded about sort of higher immigration. Well, in, 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 your, in your book, you quote, you quote the CPS's other founder, Keith Joseph, on who yes. you pointed out that you know, the centre ground, there is a difference between the centre ground and the common ground. Yes. Yeah, well, this is, a, I think that the, the centre ground, I think, has been a very convenient uh, conceit for some time uh, for centrists because it's taken to mean three different things in one go. It's taken to mean... Uh, their own beliefs, which is political and economic liberalism. It's also tended to, to, it's been taken to mean political moderation because it's supposedly the centre point between right and left, which is the argument that Keith Joseph brilliant took, brilliantly took a part in uh, in that famous lecture. Um, uh, but it's also taken to mean supposedly where the mainstream of public opinion is. Um, but we know that we know that that's not true in itself, but it's obviously untrue to say that it is simultaneously all three of those th things. But it is, it is very convenient for people who believe those things to to elide the three different definitions. Um, I'm, I'm going to open it up to questions um, soon, so please um, do um, put them in the Q and A uh, form. But um, one one slightly uh, um, awkward question. I mean, you. Uh, you know, you, you are now a Telegraph columnist. Before that, you were chief of staff to, to Theresa May. You tried this strategy in 2017 and it didn't go well for, for, all, yeah. for, all, for all kinds of reasons. I mean, social care um, being, being one of them, um, the, the, the campaign strategy, you know, all, you know um, we can, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of pretty long list. But, you know, is this, in your view, a sort of sustainable Tory coalition? This, does, this, does, does this work as a basis for the party? Or do you know? Um, and by the way, I I would say yes, it does. Um, or um, or is this something that kind of rests on the charisma and sort of the especially the kind of the Brexit credentials of Boris Johnson? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean <laughs> we did, this was basically the political strategy of Theresa's premiership between uh, twenty sixteen and seventeen, um, and then and then you know I mean we screwed up in many ways in that election and uh, and and. You know, some of the things that went wrong with that were my fault and some of them were uh, for broader reasons. Um, uh, but I don't think, I don't, I don't think the ineptitude of that campaign junks the political strategy that uh, we applied in the year beforehand, which, um, you know, we obviously did blow the 20 odd point lead in that campaign, but it was also that political strategy that got to the 20 odd point lead. Um, and Boris, I think, has actually pursued a pretty similar electoral strategy and it did and it and it did work uh, in 2019. Um, I mean, my sense is that it does work for the party. I mean sometimes you get people say well this isn't where the future is uh, because uh, because you know young people uh, might be more socially liberal or uh, ethnic minority voters are uh, not so well disposed uh, to the Tory party but I mean 
you know, the Tory party could um, just cling to its kind of uh, camera near a 35% strategy and lose every election for the next 20 years in the hope that, uh, that all those young people age and are, and, and are followed by younger people with similar views. Uh, or it can deal with the electorate as it exists now and it tries to take the right decisions for the country on the basis of the challenges it perceives right now. Uh, and I think that's what um, this political strategy does. Um, the big question to me is, um, is, is Brexit was the, was the really defining issue that really helped to get a lot of those former Labour voting working class voters in the, in the Midlands and the North and in Wales to come over to the Tories. Um, I think it would be a big mistake to assume that the Tories have those votes in the bag in the future. And in order to be able to rely on that support into the future, uh, the Tories are going to have to have a different economic pers perspective to the one that they've previously had. And obviously the economic interventions that the government has made uh, in light of the pandemic have partly been because of the size of the problem that they face, but I think also because of, um, because of the realisation in Downing Street that this is their new electoral coalition. Um, but it's also the case that um, I don't think cultural issues are just dis are just going to disappear. I don't think I don't think Brexit was a one-off. Uh, questions of culture and identity are now much more politically salient uh, than they have been for uh, for many years. And and so that I think I think to retain those votes, uh, the Tories are going to need to uh, to to still be quite robust on those questions of identity and culture. And I don't know really whether. Uh, right now, uh, Boris thinks he wants to really do that. You can, he can certainly do it on law and order. Whether he wants to do it on questions of, uh, you know, human rights law, his immigration policies are still pretty um, uh, sort of open and liberal. Um, I'm not entirely certain uh, that those voters will love uh, the reality of the points-based system um, if it's introduced in its um, proposed form. Uh, so that, to me, is the um, unknown at the moment for the next election or two. I mean, I remember uh, back in the day, um, I wrote a piece saying uh, that, you know, that no, what no one spotted was that Theresa May's strategy was essentially kind of John Howard. It was a very, you know, there was, there was a real, the, the same sort of you know, appealing to the, to the provinces, the suburbs, the, you know. And actually, you, you texted me from number 10 and said, you know, finally someone spotted it. Um, although, you know, although I would obviously now argue that, um, that now, uh, given the severity of the economic crisis we have, we, we, now is precisely when we need market-driven private sector deregulatory growth, because otherwise um, everyone's going to be poor, everyone's going to be unemployed, and there's going to be a lot of, of issues. Yeah, look, I mean, I, th I think it's important that I don't allow my position on economic issues to be sort of parroted beyond uh, reality. I mean, of course, I like growth. Growth obviously comes from uh, the private sector. To me, the question is, um, is, uh, is the country set up to actually maximise its potential for growth and for improved productivity and competitiveness? And, you know, if you are, broadly speaking, relying on London and the South East and a couple of pockets uh, beyond that uh, for your growth, then you're not, you know, you're not flying your plane using all your engines. Um, and we need to um, uh, we need to do much more to make sure that there is much more regional growth and regional productivity improvements. Uh, and uh, and it, it, I think to do that, given uh, given the the state of uh, lots of local economies in those regions, we are going to need a more strategic role for the state, um, and and we're certainly going to need much more investment in infrastructure but also in human capital and you know Tories are always fond of talking about supply side reforms and you know if there are um, if there are changes that are um, that are about regulation or particular taxes or whatever that we think uh, are going to uh, suit that strategic objective of better regional growth uh, then great and you know clearly leaving the EU, one of the advantages of leaving the EU is our ability to be a bit more nimble and to change our regulatory framework. And there are, there are certain things that we can do with business taxes, whether it's to do with 
research and development or investment in plant and machinery and that kind of thing, um, uh, where we should totally do that. Uh, but I think the supply, some of the supply side reforms that matter the most actually require investment now, uh, because in the nature of the, of the modern economy that we, that we are operating in, we're going to need far better skills and education levels and more appropriate skills and education levels uh, not only for people as they leave school and university uh, and college, uh, but also for people whose jobs are being made obsolete by trading patterns or changing technology. Um, so, and that and that is not going to come cheap. Okay, well, let's let's move to the um, to Q and A. And then the first first question from um, uh, someone else who's worked in uh, in Number Ten, uh, although slightly more recently, uh, James Poole, which is. Is big state conservatism affordable? We have 1.8 trillion pounds in debt, ever more calls for spending and taxation, uh, an all-time taxation at an all-time high, and uh, are dangerously uh, dependent on a few people for a lot of revenue. What, ha you know, what happens if the money goes away? Well, the, the, the fact that we are so exposed to uh, sort of, you know, relatively few people and industries uh, um, to contribute in that kind of way is part of the problem, and we definitely need to try to find a way of um, not only broadening uh, um, the economy in the sense of, uh, of potential future growth, but obviously broadening um, our tax base as well. Uh, I mean, I think one of the one of the things that I think we that some I think some people are getting wrong at the moment is the way uh, that instinctively they are comparing the fiscal situation we're in now to what happened after the financial crash. Precisely because um, the financial crash um, uh, was connected to a banking crisis, and because you know crashes are, um, are are literally sort of bubbles bursting, and the realization that you are not as prosperous as you once thought you were, um, um, and the effects that and the role that banks have in an economy, uh, the uh, the fiscal hit after the financial crash was long and ongoing and we were actually quite badly exposed in terms of um, the extent of our deficit um, and so the period of fiscal correction was obviously quite a long one and quite a painful one. Uh, even then there were political choices uh, to be made, policy choices to be made that, uh, that where ministers decided uh, to go uh, probably you know quite aggressively uh, to towards uh, deficit reduction and took decisions on things like capital spend uh, that I think were probably wrong. Um, but this situation is pretty different. I mean, uh, you know, the whole world is going through this. Um, uh, pretty much every Western economy is going to have uh, comparable levels of debt after this. Um, uh, we don't yet know the nature of um, of the uh, of the recovery, and so we don't know what that means in terms of the deficit beyond uh, this year. But the environment that we're in is very different to that period after the crash, uh, and and I, and, and the markets uh, will clearly be cognizant of that fact. Um, uh, another question from uh, Ronald Lehman. Uh, I just. Um, uh, spotted there was, there was at least one journalist uh, in the audience uh, who. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> just, just trying to think, think whether either of us has had anything particularly controversial. Um, uh, Ron, so, 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 so many loyal Conservative voters were understandably incandescent at the uh, 2017 manifesto. Um, um, given the, the barnstorming success of, of 2019, when obviously um, uh, much, a much better written document, I, I, I would say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, the, well, yeah, um, I congratulate the authors of the 29 Manifesto for precisely not writing the kind of historic document that I did. In, 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 fact, in fact, you know, I don't think I'm breaching any confidences when we say, you know, when, when you know, there, was a, there was a positive determination to steer away from, uh, and, 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 also, and even, even like in terms of just getting the work out under what you... Um, and the, and the way you'd had it, um, but no, the um, uh, yeah. So, what, what are the lessons for the well, the, the 2024 campaign, and also for Sean Bailey's campaign in, in London? Well, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, God, I mean, where do I start with the mistakes that we made? Um, uh, I mean, I'll limit them to the manifesto. Um, I think we um, we took a knowing calculation uh, that was based on the. Um, uh, on the political space that we thought we had. Uh, you know, we did go into that election campaign 
being 20 odd points ahead in the polls and being ahead on uh, in every region of the country. And I, I remember writing an op-ed saying congratulations to Nick Timothy and Theresa May for using for using their 20 point lead to tackle bravely to, to bravely tackle issues such as social <laughs> yeah and, other, and the triple lock and other other long term problems. Uh, yeah, and uh, and you know in the end we obviously got that calculation wrong because uh, because we didn't you know we didn't have that political space and I think I think I. I think I've said elsewhere that um, I think one of the problems, uh, and obviously there's a, you know, there a problem in policy judgment, which I take responsibility for. One of the problems was that we were, I, I'd spent some time before the election campaign trying to get Theresa to agree to change fiscal policy, um, which obviously... Um, and, 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 and Philip Hammond, or do you... Well, I don't think the conversation, to be fair, to be fair, I'm not sure that conversation ever really reached Philip because um, you know, she agreed with um, uh, with some with a sort of small change, which actually he agreed with too. But um, uh, but ultimately, she wasn't really prepared to uh, to undertake a serious shift on fiscal policy, and um, and this is crude language because I don't really like either term, but it's a, it sort of at least encapsulates the point. Uh, I said elsewhere that. It, in the end, I think we're trying to write a kind of post-liberal budget on a, a, a post-liberal uh, uh, manifesto on a neoliberal budget, um, uh, because um, and, and 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 that sort of pushed us into certain uh, certain positions on things like free school meals and um, uh, and different pensioner benefits. I mean, actually, on things like winter fuel payments, uh, I think regardless of the fiscal context, that clearly needs to change still. Uh, and I think on uh, you know, the triple lock, as I'm sure we will see in the coming months, um, is not really um, sustainable for very much longer anyway. So I think regardless of the fiscal context, those are worthy changes, partly because we were in this uh, headspace of thinking that we had political room to take uh, some difficult decisions. We also, um, we also, I think, had our heads too much in government and not enough in campaigning. Uh, I mean, certainly for the first half of that campaign, it didn't really feel like a normal election campaign because nobody took Labour seriously at all, and at least of all in the broadcast media, for example. Um, and I think we had our heads uh, stuck in, in in that kind of space as well. So I think though that ultimately the problem was uh, a kind of thematic one that goes a bit broader than the social care policy, I think, which is that actually it... Uh, it, it played into people's concerns. Uh, some people who were sort of looking, looking to trust the Tory party and wanted uh, to trust the Tory party and then, and then saw these things and got a bit scared off. So, and in terms of, 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 sort of, of what, what should happen, e.g. in London or, or in 2024? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the thing is, <laughs> uh, I think I, 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 you should probably, um, I think the, the police never allow um, uh, somebody who's um, discharged a firearm to go on firearms duty again. So you're probably the wrong person to ask. So I'm scarred by my experience. Um, I, um, I, I, I think the truth is uh, we, we, we've set a slightly horrible precedent, which means that uh, political parties are going to be very risk averse when it comes to uh, publishing manifestos now. And from a sort of narrow partisan interest, I would say that is probably sensible based on my experience. Uh, but I think in terms of the quality of political discourse and honesty and the mandates that political parties need to earn to be able to take some of those difficult decisions, um, that's unfortunate. Um, uh, and, and if you are going to, you know, if you are going to make big decisions on things like pensioner benefits, uh, it would really be better to do them uh, if you not only if you've made clear that that's your intent, but at the, you know, the very least, uh, not promise the opposite. So, so um, a couple of questions on, on China, where you're obviously um, a sort of fairly prominent skeptic. Um, um, so what's your current view um, in light of COVID, WHO, Huawei, um, Hong Kong? And, um, and, and the other question to fold in was about um, the, um, the nuclear uh, industry, where obviously you, um, you, were, you famously uh, paused, uh, paused Tinkley Point before it uh, went ahead and, and in this book you kind of suggest that that was Theresa uh, folding rather than you being convinced of its merits. Uh, yeah I mean I, I mean I tried to tried and failed to stop Hinckley. Um, 
I mean, I think, uh, I started working in the Home Office in 2010, um, when I think large parts of the public probably had never heard of Huawei. Um, but it was apparent pretty quickly um, what China was up to in terms of its capabilities and its mass industrial espionage uh, and its wider policies in terms of setting debt traps around the world, but not only to you know, countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, um, you know, and Djibouti and places like that, but also in the West. Um, and there's a clear purpose behind their strategy of investing in certainly British critical national infrastructure is to give themselves greater geopolitical leverage uh, and protection. Um, and so, and so even, in, even in those days, in, in the, in, back in the coalition government, I was, uh, I was always um, slightly gobsmacked by the golden era strategy. Um, I think it's a matter of public record that, um, uh, that the concerns of the intelligence agencies were put uh, to senior ministers and, um, and the answer uh, from one particular senior minister was, well, they're going to do all of this stuff anyway. Uh, we might as well take the money, um, uh, which is a pretty grim and cynical conclusion. Um, so, I mean, I'm sorry that it's taken so long for the correction in the policy. Um, and it's also unfortunate that it's, uh, it's come about in, in the circumstances that it has. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm relieved that we are um, finally waking up to the, the dangers of China. And you're, you know, we're beginning to see, I think, the beginning of proper international cooperation against China and against some of the things it's trying to do through the five eyes. Um, um, you know, sadly, not yet through the European Union, which still seems to be taking quite a weak position. Um, uh, a couple of questions from uh, uh, from um, Anthony Johnson and um, uh, and Matt Smith on on devolution, and it, essentially, sort of ones about Manchester, ones about um, the, the the union. But it's sort of, they sort of both boil down to you. What do you do if devolution like delivers people you don't agree with? What do you do if you're 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 in Manchester and you know you're a Tory and you vote against having elected mayor, and then you get Andy Burnham? Uh, well, you have to suck it up. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's politics and that's democracy, isn't it? I mean, I, I do think that um, obviously political choices reflect values, and that is always true in, in elections. Um, uh, somehow, though, I feel that um, this obviously isn't always true, and we saw sort of serious extremism in uh, Labour councils in the early 80s in particular. Um, uh, but I think often with with local politics um, with, and with local elections, um, actually some of the political differences aren't aren't necessarily as great. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm from Birmingham, and there's a Conservative mayor in the West Midlands, and I think I think I think the West Midlands mayoralty is set up in a slightly crazy way, where he's effectively the chairman of the combined authority, which is split. Uh, between Labour and Conservative councils, so he's kind of hamstrung. But even in that setup, Andy Street is managing to get things done uh, while chairing a committee in uh, that, that consists of council leaders who are um, uh, who are from a different political persuasion. Um, and I think there is there is I think sometimes in in local politics the problems maybe because they're closer to hand, maybe because sometimes they feel a little bit more uh, practical. They can sometimes feel a little less ideological. Um, but of course, like, we have to accept if we're going to devolve power, then sometimes people we don't like will win. And again, a couple of questions. Um, uh, Thomas Moss asks, what you think of the photo on, on my wall? And uh, referring to my, uh, it's actually a, a portrait, but um, <laughs> never mind. And um, uh, someone else asks um, whether, you, you know, this is kind of the, 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 the equivalent of a sort of gently lobbed uh, uh, dolly that you can smash with six. But do you think Joseph Chamberlain is still relevant? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm Mrs. Thatcher. I mean, I think she, uh, she, she saved the country from a very serious predicament. Um, and she did it probably just about in time as well. Um, uh, but I think, you know, to, we're in the year 2020, she left office in 1990. Um, uh, the challenges of today are uh, very different to the challenges of the 80s. 
um, uh, some of the challenges actually do relate to the some of the unintended consequences of some of the decisions uh, she took. Um, and, and I think some of the people who are sort of, uh, you know, um, adherents of Thatcherism uh, are often much more ideological than Margaret Thatcher herself was. I mean, she obviously, um, you know, had people like Michael Heseltine in her cabinet. She, um, she got Nissan to Sunderland. She um, uh, um, sort of um, paved the way for, um, I think maybe, maybe this was actually in the, in the major government, but the, 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 but the Conservatives in those years paved the way for things like uh, Canary Wharf. There was a lot of investment that went into places like Liverpool. Um, and also she was, you know, she was obviously a, 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 a social conservative. Um, uh, I, th I think, it, I can't remember who it was who said that um, uh, with her reform, she envisaged a society in the image of her father, but actually bequeathed one in the image of her son. Uh, I do think sometimes we um, uh, uh, need to remember that there is an interrelationship between sort of economic and, uh, and social liberalism and conservatism. Um, on Chamberlain, like, it's really easy to sort of like take historical figures and say uh, they, may, they would do this today or whatever. Of course, that's slightly absurd. Um, I like him partly because I'm uh, biased because he was the mayor of Birmingham. Um, uh, but also, I like you know I like him because he gave the Tory party, although he was never a conservative himself, but he was in alliance with the Tories. Um, he gave uh, the Tories a real sense of social mission and gave them a lot of their social reform policies in the um, 1890s. And I think, I think it always has to be uh, one of the party's driving missions to, um, to think about the condition of working class people uh, and, to, and to try to elevate that condition. So um, um, Alex Morton, our head of policy, has chipped in. Um, can't lead to continue an argument we've been having in the office. Um, so he, his his point is that if you if you take away the triple lock, um, if you uh, you know if you introduce social care reforms to make people pay for more of their own care, it, it effectively what you're doing is kind of stripping out like the stuff that the middle gets. So you're kind of almost reverting to that kind of slightly patrician Cameron uh, era. Um, sort of approach where you know you have um, you know you have you have tax cuts for the wealth creators at the top. You have um, support for the uh, you know for the people who can't help themselves at the bottom. But you know you're you're sort of leaving the um, you, you know but the middle the sort of middle feel uh, feel left out left out and ignored. And I should say that Alex and I have long arguments about the triple lock. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm firmly on your side in this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really accept that because, I mean, firstly, on the triple lock, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think we proposed replacing it with a double lock anyway. So, I mean, it was hardly like a, a swinging cut. It was more about um, uh, managing the growth of pensions rather than, uh, rather than sort of severely reducing them or anything like that. We have to really remember the way in which a lot of pension, uh, pensioner incomes have, have grown um, over the last decade or so at a time when... Uh, working age incomes have not at all. Um, um, and I think um, on social care, I mean, I think like, at the end of the day, I mean, social care needs to be fixed uh, uh, for its own sake, for the fact that the number of old people uh, and the number of old people with debilitating conditions uh, is going to grow year on year into the future. Uh, and not only is that sort of bad for them as individuals, uh, it's you know, uh, potentially ruinous for lots of families who don't realise at the moment that actually they do risk losing their own home uh, um, to, to fund some of those care costs. Uh, and it's also really bad for the NHS because there's no, literally no point in protecting the NHS either in terms of funding or policy only to ne neglect social care, which causes uh, this great big backup and overcrowding on hospital wards, which ends up going all the way to A and D. So it really needs to be addressed. And there's a finite number of ways in which you can. You know, Rob wrote about this in the Sunday Times uh, at the weekend. Uh, ultimately, no, you know, nobody likes being paid, to, uh, nobody likes being asked to pay more uh, money, um, especially when it's for something that, you know, lots of voters don't appreciate yet what, uh, you know, the size of, of this particular problem. Uh, but there's a finite number of ways of paying for it, and we're going to have to make this decision. I mean, I, I just like, policy and action is no longer a feasible uh, solution, uh, whether it's doing it through general taxation, whether it's doing it through uh, um, 
uh, people's property wealth, whether an insurance policy really is feasible. Uh, I don't think it would be feasible in terms of fixing the problem for anybody over the age of 40 or 45 or whatever. And if you are taking it out of things like property wealth, are you doing it so that it's effectively a charge uh, for the people who need the care, or are you doing it so that it's a tax so that you fully pull the risk? These are all choices that can be made, but in the end, uh, further inaction is just, I think, you know, the, the pandemic and um, the problem in social care homes is proving uh, that further inaction really isn't feasible anymore. So we, we've got time for, for probably one last question um, before the uh, before we, so, so that you can make kickoff. Um, All my remaining um, four hairs fall out and stress. <laughs> so I wanted to. Um, I mean, this is sort of strange. So, it's like, so you know, this is about what next to the Conservative Party. Who are so sort so of two parallel questions really? Who are the up and coming Conservatives that you think reflect your your vision, or or sort of separately? Like, if you look in the crystal ball, I mean, are you excited about the future of the party? Do you, who are the talented people? You know, obviously everyone's paying attention to Rishi Sunak at the moment, um, and um, you know, I personally placed uh, like about two hundred quid on him becoming the next uh, Tory leader in November, and stand to make quite a lot of money if he does become leader so I'm you know I'm obviously quite, you know qualifying my brain there but, but who are the you know it, it, like the, the you know the, the, the cabinet of 2030 um if there is a, a sort of a, a Tory hegemony you know who what, what what does it look like to you who are the who are the people I mean how how have things changed well I'd be honest I don't think there's an individual I would say that person stands for exactly what uh, I believe in um but I mean that's um that's not really the point of the exercise is it because uh, clearly, you know, a party needs to uh, have a, a range of beliefs and views and values. Um, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit biased with some of the cabinet ministers because some of them are my friends. I think I think Oliver Dowden is having a pretty good. Well, uh, I was talking about, about, like, you know, the the, the next generation. Uh, yeah, um, um, and I think Rishi is obviously an incredibly talented politician. Um, I think of the new intake. Um, uh, I think Danny Krieger's maiden speech was wonderful. Uh, and I think he's, I think he's a very interesting thinker and somebody worth watching. Um, and I think I'm, I'm interested in, in some of the guys who represent uh, the old Red Wall constituencies. Uh, you know, my friend Eddie Hughes in Warsaw, but, um, uh, you know, whether it's Ben Bradley or other figures, um, I think it's really important. They have a disproportionately important role in terms of making sure that the party uh, doesn't take its eye off the ball um, in in thinking about the the interests and the values uh, of of the new voters that it's attracted over the last two elections. Well, well um, which brings us neatly to to five fifty nine. So finishing precisely on time. Um, can I? I'm sorry for for the people who asked questions who didn't get a chance to um, to speak. Um, hopefully we'll do we'll do this again um, when we can all see each other in in person. Um, but thank you very much uh, to Nick Timothy. Um, thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, just a reminder, if you're interested in coming to more of these, um, you, there's a form you can fill in on the CPS website at cps.org.uk, or you can follow us at Twitter. Um, we uh, are you know, always doing um, trying to do interesting things and, and talk to interesting people. But um, Nick, I'm sorry we couldn't uh, give you the launch that you deserved, but I hope this was some consolation. And thank, you. thank you all very, very much. Thanks.